it's the access that it gets us to important stakeholders that we would not have had an access to before i think that in and of itself has been so huge and transformational for us as a startup you know the these are some of the top people in the world that you can connect with to try and identify people who get the paradigm shift and who've placed that at the heart of their strategy whether as a business or a foundation but really place that into their strategy and not as a peripheral thing i think that's really where the value is for people like us at desolinator i think the uh, uplink connection has been huge for us because um we always have international ambitions you, we are always hoping to gain gain kind of some communication connections with uh, world health organization and get introduced to different healthcare systems and i, I think like uplink has done a great job of accelerating that process being part of this cohort has been uh been absolutely amazing in making sure that we are in touch with the right people again at the right time and to ensure that our technologies and and services are able to not only help uh with covid-19 but in any way that we can impact the overall scientific and medical community I really think that Uplink has the opportunity to to do a tremendous amount in connecting uh in supporting entrepreneurs uh who really are the vanguards the the entrepreneurs the ones who are out there pushing for change and and reimagining our world it's the access that it gets us to important stakeholders that we would not have had an access to before i think that in and of itself has been so huge and transformational for us as a startup you know the these are some of the top people in the world that you can connect with to try and identify people who get the paradigm shift and who've placed that at the heart of their strategy whether as a business or a foundation but really place that into their strategy and not as a peripheral thing i think that's really where the value is for people like us at desolinator i think the uh, uplink connection has been huge for us because um we always have international ambitions you, we are always hoping to gain gain kind of some communication connections with uh, world health organization and get introduced to different healthcare systems and i, I think like uplink has done a great job of accelerating that process being part of this cohort has been uh been absolutely amazing in making sure that we are in touch with the right people again at the right time and to ensure that our technologies and and services are able to not only help uh with covid-19 but in any way that we can impact the overall scientific and medical community I really think that Uplink has the opportunity to to do a tremendous amount in connecting uh in supporting entrepreneurs uh who really are the vanguards the the entrepreneurs the ones Welcome everyone. Uh, today you're joining us for the Davos agenda of the World Economic Forum and you're joining the panel called Building Crisis Resistant Healthcare Systems in a Post-COVID World. Um I lead the Access to Medicine Foundation and I'll be moderating the session today. Um tomorrow we'll be launching some more results of the Access to Medicine Index on how the pharmaceutical industry has made enough steps to address some of the issues of access to health globally and how they enable or hurt uh health systems with their actions. But today we're going to discuss um resilience of health systems so give please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to our panelists let me introduce them real quickly uh Jeff Martha who's the chairman and chief executive uh, officer of Medtronic 
Helen Clark, who's the Prime Minister of New Zealand from 1999 to 2008 and co-chair of the current independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response. Francis D'Souza, President and CEO of Illumina, and Mark Harrison, who's President and CEO of Intermountain Healthcare. Now, many of you, um, welcome to all. So um, many of you would, would appreciate that the issue of importance of uh, crisis resistance health system has been extremely acute in the past uh, few uh, months to a year. So today we're gonna discuss uh, a little bit more about what does it mean to build uh, healthcare systems and strengthen them uh, as we're learning from uh, what COVID has done to our systems itself. So to kick off uh, today, um, I wanted to kind of reflect a little bit about the parallel session we had this morning. Uh, some parts of this morning covered key issues on how we need to see health as an asset, improve trust and collaborations, and prevent that the most vulnerable populations are left behind. So carrying on in that front, uh, we're gonna discuss today a little bit more on some of the core elements that make systems uh, resilient. So um, just to kick off, um, Helen, maybe tell us from your experience, what do you think are the core elements that make health systems uh, resilient? And how can we invest in health systems differently to ensure that these are more crisis resistant? Thanks, thanks very much. And my first point was going to be that often discussions on resilience are quite theoretical discussions, but uh, Sadly, we have a, a very real life experience that we're all living through now, uh, where we see that our health systems weren't particularly resilient at all in so many cases. Uh, but we also see that the situation we were confronted with uh, needed much more than health systems per se uh, to be performing, to be able to respond uh, well. So the, the key thing now, and I think this is also central to the concept of resilience, is to learn from what has happened so we can be better prepared uh, if and, and when this happens again. Now, investing in resilience of a system, investing in preparedness for what might happen, is a bit like attending to the, the dog which may not have barked. This dog has barked very, very loudly. Uh, but uh, often, I guess, when uh, health ministers are uh, lobbying for scarce resources in a budget, uh, the attitude may be, well, it hasn't happened, so you know, why do you need to uh, in invest in this? Uh, well, we now know uh, that the old saying, of be prepared, is, is absolutely uh, critical. And part of being prepared uh, for the kind of, of shock uh, that our health systems and our societies and economies have been going through in recent times is we do need uh, flexible uh, planning around adverse events, in this case, a, a pandemic. We, we need foresight in our health systems and our governments to be able to envisage what the possible threats and risks are and to be able to uh, plan and, and mitigate uh, around those. In the case of this uh, current uh, pandemic, the number one objective has really got to be to try to curb uh, transmission. But so many health systems have got out of the way of, of, of talking about and communicating with publics about the most basic uh, public health uh, measures. And uh, to have a system that can really perform in these circumstances and engage public, uh, consistent messaging, uh, good communication, clear leadership, uh, you know, these, these are so important. And they may not be health specific, but your health system won't be able to perform if it's not reinforced uh, by uh, all of, of that. Uh, so I think uh, one thing we've very much learned out of this pandemic is a resilient uh, health system has to be one of those characteristics that it has to maintain other basic capacities uh, to test, to trace, to quarantine, and now uh, we'll be faced with this huge exercise of mass, uh, mass vaccination on a scale uh, not seen across uh, age groups as, as well. Uh, so you know, all of this, I think, uh, has been very taxing uh, for our health systems as well, and that have time to go into it now. Uh, but we've seen in the response how important uh, universal access to uh, services is. You know, universal health care is important but insufficient in itself. But if you don't have it and you're faced with circumstances like, like these, uh, the most marginalised uh, will miss out. 
and, and that will impact then on the whole society because if none of us are safe, uh, none of us are safe until all of us are, are safe. Uh, I think we've also learned a lot during this pandemic about uh, the need to plan for health system or health service continuity, uh, because uh, when we uh, go uh, you know, full thrust after a pandemic, uh, other services can fall by the wayside, including in the wealthiest of, 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 of countries. Uh, so much to, uh, to learn from that. We're, we've learned that vulnerable populations uh, need access to social protection. Otherwise, it's hard to observe uh, some of the strongest uh, uh, provisions uh, like, like lockdowns. Uh, so, you know, as I said, often we could have theoretical discussions about resilience, but uh, this real life experience has caused us to sort of zero in on what are the whole range of factors which would make us uh, more resilient to the kind of uh, extraordinary shock that we've been living through. Great. Thanks, Helen, for this. I mean, just a quick follow up on this. The, the panel has received kind of numerous urgent requests from prioritizing vaccine delivery in resource poor settings and issues like the lack of medical oxygen, uh, which is an essential medicine in, in name uh, and has been already a problem for many years, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, from your experience, how can governments engage the right partners uh, to solve these issues when they're in the middle of a crisis? I mean, becoming less dependent on goodwill of others and have more security of success? Well, one of the learnings from this has to be uh, to be prepared on, on an ongoing basis. And that I, I, I actually think every country should be doing the sort of review that the World Health Assembly has asked for of the internationally coordinated response. Because you know, we just weren't ready in, in so many uh, respects. It's very hard to build those relationships w when you're on the run. W what I would say is there has been a tremendous amount of, 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 of goodwill from uh, private sector, public sector, uh, third sector, fourth sector, uh, to, to come to the party and help in the middle of a crisis. But it, it's been a you know, response that's had to be very rapidly assembled. And I think we... We need to go back and look at what, what's the long-term planning here? What relationships do we need uh, to, to deal with the worst that, that life can, can throw at us? Great. I mean, I think that you've touched on an important point that the agility is, is something that we've counted on uh, in order to address this particular response. Jeff uh, and Francis, I'll start with uh, yeah, Jeff uh, addressing this. We've seen numerous initiatives that have emerged in response to COVID-19. Uh, how has the private sector engaged in this response, uh, including your company? And how can we transform sure. efforts to a more sustainable approach so that we're more future-proof uh, when it comes to improving health systems? Sure. Well, I'll hit on a, a couple of points that I think are obvious, um, and there's some great examples, and then a few that may not be so obvious. So the, the two that jumps out, you mentioned agility. I, I, I'd say uh, agile innovation uh, is one area where the, the private sector really helped. I mean, obviously, the, the whole story about the vaccine is uh, the multiple vaccines and the speed in which they were developed is, is truly amazing. Uh, beyond that, um, in the sector that, that, that Tronic plays in medical technologies, uh, you know, there was, again, innovation played a big role in developing, I'd call it like remote and virtual capabilities um, and enhancing those very quickly, whether it be for patient monitoring uh, in and out of the hospital, uh, device management, whether it be remotely managing ventilators, which we manufacture from outside of the uh, ICU, so healthcare workers don't have to enter uh, the ICU to um, uh, uh, you know, remotely man managing, uh, you know, patients that have medical devices to keep them outside of the hospital. So that like people with pacemakers and implantable defibrillators that normally would have to come into the healthcare system every couple of months to get their devices checked or reprogrammed to do that remotely. So to keep the hospitals free of these types of patients so they can deal with the COVID patients. And, and also remote training and medical education, doing this virtually, um, you know, and, and so things like, you know, again, getting back to the ventilator example, you know, creating uh, training uh, venues, virtual training venues, so uh, healthcare workers knew quickly how to work on all types of ventilators that, uh, because they were, get, they were working on new ventilators in many cases they weren't trained on. So I'd say agile innovation is a big one. Second one is, is supply chain. You know, working with, you know, there's a lot of work that went on uh, in the private sector working with governments to keep, you know, supply chains open. Some of it was, you know, advocacy and, and explanation. Uh, as, as for a while there, like on the ventilator side of things, there was a, 
a period of time back in April, May, where governments were considering uh, some, some, some na- not just the United States, but also in Europe, some nationalistic moves that would have really uh, hurt the movement of, of ventilators around the world. And, and I think industry helped to keep those, uh, through explaining the, the impact of what those would do, keep the, um, keep the supply chain, uh, you know, the, 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 the borders open. And I think just collaborating um, across different industries to help the supply chain, to source critical parts that were in short supply or creating surge capacity, like in the case of working with contract manufacturers to, to create you know, surge capacity. And, and again, as the prime minister said uh, you know, before, it's hard to do this when you're on the run, and it would be better to do this in advance. But we were able to quickly create not just you know, improve the, uh, you know, the production of ventilators by five times in just a matter of months, but um, within our own walls at Medtronic, but working with uh, contract manufacturers to, to increase the capacity by orders of magnitude. Or like working with, with uh, companies that aren't healthcare related, like uh, SpaceX, for example, to, to source critical parts uh, for ventilators. I mean, they're, they're definitely, a, 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 you know, a, a unique bedfellow uh, for medical technology but it worked. Um, and so these are things, you know, the innovation, the supply chain, uh, not just ramping up uh, the, um, the capacity, but partnering with other companies, even outside of healthcare to improve supply chain and, 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 and provide surge capacity. And then areas that I think that, that weren't as well discussed, um, you know, during the pandemic was just the, even the allocation of supplies and equipment, you know, doing this based on need. I mean, they're really, during the pandemic, even within countries, it was difficult. And, and working across countries was there was really no, there really, at least in the med tech space, there wasn't much in the way of um, help, if you will, from from the international you know governments to to help allocate these uh, supplies. And so uh, I think you know I think you know private sector did a good job doing this and doing it based on need uh, and filling a, a gap uh, that was there. And then finally, distribution. Um, you know, we've got uh, field representatives all around the world and, and every uh, hospital, and it may not be the most efficient way to do it, but it is agile when, when you are in a crisis, you know, getting these critical supplies uh, down all the way to the patient, and to, you know, the right patient at the right time, you know, industry played a, a big role. So there's a lot of areas, and I, and I think going forward, though, uh, and, and the Prime Minister started with this in her opening remarks was, in a trust and collaboration to make this more resilient. I do think, you know, we need industry and, and, you know, you know, public sector and the health systems need to, to work better together. And I think the industry needs to be part of the conversation earlier on, you know, we've got to break down, you know, what I would argue is still a bit of a trust bar- barrier and, and, and really move to, to a, a short list of partnerships versus a, you know, a list, a long list of vendors. Because you know, in, in, in a crisis, the, the, the vendor transactional relationship doesn't work. And so, um, you know, look, I, I think you know, the different segments, whether it be a hospital and an industry player like Medtronic, and we've got to start communicating on a more strategic level versus through you know, RFPs. And, and um, you know, finally, I, I do think as we move forward, uh, you're ta- we're talking about continuing to prove outcomes uh, continuing to lower costs and at the same time improve access. You know, technology is really the only way you can do this. Uh, to do these, you know, what seem to be diametrically opposed forces sometimes, technology has to be part of the answer. So I think going forward, uh, technology, uh, partnerships with industry, uh, you fully leverage the technology uh, to, to, you know, you know to, to drive these three things at the same time. Great. Thanks, Jeff, for this. Francis, um, what are your thoughts on this? And how do you actually transform some of the efforts that you've been making into a more sustainable approach, uh, especially when you think of uh, other companies around the sector? Yeah, this pandemic has highlighted that a a deep and effective partnership between the public, private and not for profit sectors are essential for successful global health. Uh, You know, uh, the private sector brings a number of uh, uh, things to the equation, specifically innovation, uh, especially around technology, the uh, agility in deploying that innovation, um, expertise, and also just experience. Uh, we at Illumina, you know, work in over 130 countries around the world. We have partnerships with health systems in those countries, uh, and that's really played out in this pandemic. We were called into Wuhan in December 2019 to work with the local health authorities to try and identify the causative agent behind 
who was then an ammonia of unknown origin. And we were working then, you know, through January with the Shanghai Public Health Clinic to uh, sequence uh, and then publish the first viral genome of SARS-CoV-2. And since then, we've been working with CDCs and health systems around the world to uh, identify the mutations in the virus and, and watch how the virus is spread. And so we've played an important role, and genomics has played an important role in the identification of this, of this pandemic and then in the surveillance of how this pandemic is spreading. We've also played uh, an essential role in the development of these new generations of nucleic acid vaccines and therapies. Uh, the Moderna team and the BioNTech team depend on genomic sequences to develop their mRNA vaccines. In fact, uh, these Stefan, the CEO of Moderna, talks about the fact that they've never really had a live virus on their campus. They've really de relied completely on the genomic sequences coming off Illumina machines to develop these vaccines. And so, you know, we've played, uh, the private sector has played an important role in terms of, you know, helping develop the therapies and, and the vaccines, you know, to fight this pandemic. There's an important uh, surveillance uh, need right now to watch how the virus is mutating. We're seeing the emergence of, of new strains and mutations around the world, you know, 501YV1 in the UK, V2 in South Africa, and around the world. And it's essential we monitor uh, the, uh, the mutations of this virus for a couple of reasons. One, it'll tell us whether the tools we're using to fight the pandemic, whether it's the diagnostic tools, the PCR tools, or the therapies, the vaccines uh, and, the, and the therapies, will continue to be effective. And that it's essential we know that. And so we should watch how the virus is mutating and then test our tools and our vaccines against the new mutations. And companies are doing that. And you can only do that if you're monitoring the mutations. In addition, understanding how the virus is mutating and watching what strains you have in your community is essential to drive policy decisions and public health policy decisions. So, for example, if in your community you see that the infections are coming from the outside, then an effective policy decision could be to actually shut travel for a while. But if you're starting to see that the strains are local strains and that you have community-based transmission, then, then stopping people from coming in isn't really going to help that much. And so understanding you know, the, the, the spread of this virus geographically is essential from a public health policy perspective. And so it's a surveillance need that, that we've been able to help with as a private sector company. It's a therapy and vaccine development need. It's also a need around research. And one of the things we are learning is that you know, it's very, uh, there's a big spectrum. It's, it's very different how people different, react differently to COVID. For some people, there are almost no symptoms and for others, it's fatal. And we're really doing research to understand what are the genomic drivers of that difference in reaction. And that over time should help us prioritize, you know, people that need the vaccine first or need the protection. And, and so, or people who need hospitalization and scarce resources. And so there's a, a lot of work around the research behind both the virus and its mechanism of operation, but also human genomes and what causes susceptibility. And then finally, you know, there's a huge need around testing. And so whether it's PCR testing or uh, sequencing based testing and private sector sort of stepped in to, to really drive a surge in testing capacity and, and help roll that out. Overall, you know, as we look at you know, the stories of this pandemic, we're seeing that there's a transition into a new model of healthcare that's more proactive, you know, more targeted, more personalized, and more connected than ever before. And again, it's going to be essential that there is a deep partnership between public, private, and not-for-profit sectors to deliver on this. Great. Thanks, Francis, for this. Mark, um, I think you already can see that multiple people are talking about the power of technology to amplify access to healthcare and at least improve efficiency and, and costs. So how do we use uh, technology better and invest in this in order to benefit global populations? I mean, is this truly able to solve the global access to health uh, challenge or will only a few patients truly benefit from this? You know, it depends, Jay. So th first of all, Thank you. And boy, am I in the unenviable position of following three really smart people at their great comments. Um, you know, um, I think that technology is just a tool in the toolbox, right? Um, and, um, you know, the great philosopher Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And um, I, I think that the pandemic has really proven uh, Mike to be right. Um, everyone had a plan for how they were going to deal with things, and then all the rules got turned on their head. 
And what you've heard about private-public partnerships and robust supply chains and uh, nimbleness is e extraordinarily true. And one of the things that's most impressive is how quickly things like evidence-based medicine can change um, and how quickly um, and, and be incorporated into day-to-day -day practice and how quick tele and digital and AI powered tools can be, can be put into place. These work if incentives are aligned. Uh, if they're not, they become tools for rich people who would probably do fine anyhow. Um, and I think it's really important to make the distinction between health systems and health care systems. And um, if we focus too much on health care, technology, whether it's hospital at home or whether it's remote monitoring um, or whether it's, um, you know, remote visits, they, they really become the benefit of the rich only. The pandemic has actually allowed us to understand how to touch poor people via technology much more effectively. And, as our school-based clinics um, here in the Intermountain West got shut down because kids weren't in school anymore, we realized that the people who were particularly deeply affected were in our brown and black communities. And here in Utah, a lot of these folks are, are Latinx. And what we've done instead now is we've, uh, tech, we've tele-enabled these nurses' clinics and families can come in and they can get, even if they don't have their own Wi-Fi or cellular access, and they can get distance help without exposing themselves to crowded waiting rooms, um, et cetera. So to answer your question succinctly, I do think that uh, digital and tele AI powered tools become essential uh, to the democratization of healthcare and more importantly, preserving health. But you need to look upstream and understand whether the social determinants of health are met so that the most vulnerable people have access to these tools. Great, thanks for that. Um, I'd like to um, uh, tell everyone that uh, they should stay on the session as we end the public live stream in about five minutes and we'll move to a private 30 minute discussion where I can take your uh, questions and, and the panelists will be able to answer them. Now, I think what, I wanted to put just one question back on the table, uh, back to Helen. It's clear that um, choices uh, made at both national and subnational levels and what policies and measures are meant to be implemented by whom and when have shaped the severity of the epidemic in every country. Um, as co-chair of the panel, um, we know that the probability of new emerging infectious diseases to become pandemics is also a real threat. So could or should we develop accountability systems for nations and industry to prevent new pandemics? Helen? I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, that was beyond my control, but I'm um, back on, on board. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I lost track of the, the question as I, I was sitting with that. Um, so, so sorry, Jay, repeat it again. Yeah, sure. Um, should we develop accountability systems for nations and industry to prevent new pandemics? How do we make sure that uh, we're, we're ready for the future? Well, uh, I mean, one of the things we're discussing is, is what changes you might need to uh, the international health regulations and the, the obligations we accept for ourselves and the commitments we accept for ourselves as countries uh, in the international system on these things. Uh, you know, at the moment, it, it very much depends on countries doing doing the right thing, you know, reporting when they should, acting when they should, following uh, uh, the best advice and, and so on, and, and clearly that doesn't uh, always happen. The problem with the international system is, yes, you can try to negotiate, you know, stronger uh, conventions and regulations, but uh, if, if people are, are not of a mind to... Uh, abide by them will they sign up to them in, in the first place you know the whole global health system has been a, a, a bit of a balance that that who for example is quite underpowered to do the job expected of it it, it can't inspect as of right it doesn't have access as, as of right and, and so on but would it ever get that 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 right would would nation states concede that sort of you know sovereignty uh, uh, that that that's the 64 dollar question look to, to cut to the chase i think that 
this pandemic is for global health what Chernobyl was to the international you know, control system over nuclear materials. Now, when Chernobyl happened, the IAEA got new powers, which were quite significant. Uh, will this be this moment for the global uh, health system? Will the WHO get the, the power and authority that it needs uh, to hold nation states uh, to account? Uh, with respect to the, the, the private sector, well, the issues are a bit different, I think, but I... I think it has been fantastic the way the private sector has rallied, particularly around the innovation that we've been hearing about to, today. You know, the genomic sequencing, the, the innovation in testing, uh, innovation in um, a whole range of, of, of treatment areas, and the vaccine development has been uh, spectacular. Because this uh, isn't going away any any time soon, I think that uh, advances in therapeutics. Uh, need a lot of attention uh, now, and private sector innovation and drive is going to be extremely Im important in, in, in that. Uh, but we're all in it together, pub public and private, and, and I've seen you know, country by country, including my own, specific plat platforms put together uh, to engage the private sector and, and you know, just, just ensure that we're all rowing in the same boat to the end which we want, which is a, a reducing transmission and trying to you know, get our societies and economies back to some sort of normal. Great. Thanks, uh, Helen, for taking that up. So, um, so far, we've actually spoken about uh, how we need um, the right amount of foresight uh, going beyond the theoretical framework uh, looking at uh, ensuring communication, leadership, and a continuity of a, of a strong response. And um, we've spoken a bit about uh, the agility of the from, of the industry and the agility of governments to act when 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 needed. Um, also, agile innovation, improvements of supply chains and uh, distribution systems. We've uh, spoken uh, briefly about uh, the value of collaborations and and the ability to step up when when needs to to happen and how uh, multiple public and private partners have rallied together in the response, e including in, in uh, testing and, and uh, delivery of uh, much needed uh, products here. So I'd like to um, uh, um, just put a few words here that the World Economic Forum has entered a, a partnership that's been initiated called the Partnership for Health System Sustainability and Resilience, PHSSR. And it's an initiative by the London School of Economics, the World Economic Forum, and AstraZeneca. And it's um, the uh, this will be uh, used to identify transferable solutions uh, of new models of care, innovative financing, with the greatest potential to support their reduction to the world. So, if you'd like to hear more about this, please reach out to the World Economic Forum and follow the discussion.